So good afternoon, everyone. We're very pleased to welcome Susan Thornton, who is the Acting Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs back to the New York Forum Press Center. I have a few housekeeping items before we start. Please take a moment to silence your cell phones. At the conclusion of Ms. Thornton's remarks, we'll open the floor to questions. Um, when you receive the microphone, please state your name and your media affiliation. Today's briefing is on the record. And with that, let me turn the podium over to Ms. Thornton. Thank you again. Good afternoon, everyone. Great to be here in New York this week. Uh, we're nearing the end of a very busy UNGA week, and uh, we've had a lot of engagements, of course, uh, during the time that we've been here. We've had the president here for an unprecedented level of activity and engagement at the UN, a uh, number of UN events, multilateral, bilateral events, and the Secretary of State is, of course, still here, uh, continuing with his program uh, this afternoon, continuing with meetings. Uh, of course, we've had a lot of interactions with our counterparts in the Asia-Pacific region while we've been here this week at various levels, and we've had many chances to discuss the priority issues and regional security challenges and other challenges that, that we share. Uh, of course, our highest priority issue this week has been the issue of the DPRK and their illegal missile and nuclear programs. We've had a number of uh, discussions regarding this issue with a lot of different counterparts and in various formats. Um, we had, of course, yesterday's announcement by Treasury Secretary Mnuchin um, of the new executive order that the President had signed regarding new uh, authorities for the Treasury Department to pursue illicit financial transactions by, uh, you know, sanctioning entities and financial institutions that engage in transactions with the, uh, North Korea's illicit uh, weapons programs and other trading operations. Uh, and at the same time, um, we have been making clear this week that the United States does seek a peaceful resolution to the DPRK nuclear and missile issue. Um, the DPRK's rhetoric and illegal missile launches and nuclear tests will not make that country more secure. Uh, of course, the opposite is true. The DPRK's actions will also prevent the country from developing its economy and improving the lives of its people. Um, the international community will never accept the DPRKs as a nuclear-armed state, which is Pyongyang's stated goal. And unfortunately, uh, despite our efforts to reach a point where the DPRK would engage in serious negotiations, um, their belligerent and provocative behavior has demonstrated that they're not interested, at least at this point, in working toward a peaceful solution. Uh, I think that DPRK has a choice. It needs to give up its nuclear weapons and join the community of nations, or the regime will continue to condemn its people to poverty and isolation. Uh, so that is my opening statement, and I'd be happy to take some questions from anyone. Thank you. Um, I'm Eugene Yuan, uh, correspondent from Kyoto News. I have a question about uh, DPRK. Uh, South Korea government announced uh, humanitarian aid to North Korea uh, on this week. So can you support this idea and decision? So the decision has not yet, but uh, um, there is a many concern about the DPRK. Um. So we have been working on this issue of DPRK, illegal nuclear and missile programs for many, many decades. During that time, there has uh, been underway an effort by the international community to make sure that the belligerent and illicit behavior by the regime in Pyongyang does not unduly punish or affect the uh, people of North Korea. And so there are a number of UN agencies that continue to work in North Korea, continue to make uh, very concerted efforts to get make sure that we can get uh, needed humanitarian assistance directly to the North Korean people. And uh, we've made strenuous efforts over the years to make sure that we can monitor that aid to make sure that it is going directly into the hands of the people that need it. So um, I'm not sure exactly what the details are of the discussions that have occurred on this issue. 
uh, between uh, the South Koreans and other agencies, but I know that a number of countries continue to respond to uh, appeals from the different UN agencies to put, for, put make sure that we can mitigate the effects of um, the illegal programs of the government on the common people. Rita Lishar, BBC News. Um, Kim Jong-un of North Korea has responded to this week's speech from the president and the tightening of sanctions by saying that North Korea will take the highest level of hardline countermeasures in history. Does this suggest to you that the US strategy is working? And a second question, if I may, um, President Trump has said on Tuesday um, that uh, that uh, uh, he sp talk, described uh, uh, Mr. Kim as Rocket Man is on a suicide mission. What's meant by this? That the U.S. will destroy North Korea? Um, okay, to take the second question maybe first, um, I think what the president said was that the North Koreans appear to be on a mission to attack or um, to engage in some kind of prov provocation or military uh, um, sort of display aimed at the United States and or our allies, and that if that was to be the case, that the U.S. would be prepared to respond um, and to respond overwhelmingly in order to protect our interests. So I think it's important to realize that there was a statement about a response to an attack from North Korea or a provocation from North Korea that was uh, was at issue there. Uh, the North Koreans have responded um, in a way misquoting what was said and with their own sort of belligerent rhetoric. And I think um, you know I don't know whether the rhetoric means that the that the strategy that we have is working, but certainly we see the North Koreans be continually, increasingly isolated and that they are feeling that isolation. They are uh, seeing the effect of the sanctions that the international community has put in place, two unanimously approved UN Security Council resolutions, an overwhelmingly uh, large portion of their export trade be put under effective block by the UN Security Council and, and their um, export destination partners. And I think they are certainly feeling a lot of pressure. And um, I can't read the mind of Kim Jong-un, so I'm not sure whether it's in direct response to what we're doing. But I think uh, it's reasonable to assess that it is in response to the pressure they're feeling and the pretty unanimous condemnation from the international community that they're facing. Um, Alicia Rose with NHK. Um, so you said that you don't know whether the rhetoric of Kim Jong-un's statement means that the strategy is working. Can you clarify that a bit? And then also specifically on the threat of North Korea to detonate a hydrogen bomb in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, how is the U.S. prepared to respond? Well, what I meant by I can't tell whether Kim Jong-un's statement means it's, it's hard. I can't psychoanalyze Kim Jong-un, so I can't get inside his mind to know what the intention was behind their statement. All we can see is what the statement says. So um, I, I assess that the statement and the other signs that we're seeing of North Korea feeling the pressure means that the strategy of increasing pressure on the regime is having an effect on them. What we want to do, remember, and the strategy is to increase the pressure, increase diplomatic isolation, uh, increase our deterrence, our military deterrence, in order to uh, get the regime in Pyongyang to engage meaningfully in a discussion of denuclearization, which is the goal. Uh, of the international community in this engagement and in this strategy. So I think um, we see these responses in North Korea. We see them feeling the pressure. We haven't yet seen them uh, give a signal that they are ready to engage in meaningful um, negotiations on denuclearization and, and uh, rolling back their provocative behavior and uh, their illicit programs. Um, on the question about the, I think it was the, what did you call it? The hydrogen bomb. Yeah, I think, I mean, obviously such an action would be an unprecedented act of aggression 
by North Korea and would demand an international response. Um, and specifically, how is the U.S. prepared to respond? Well, I don't want to go into speculation on sort of the hypothetical response, but I think the entire international community and not just the U.S., I mean, this would be an unprecedented act and would be uh, real um, outrageous behavior on their part. So I don't, I don't want to speculate. I, I certainly hope that they would not engage in that behavior, but um, I'm sure there will be a very um, concerted and determined international response to such an act. Let's go to the front row with Ahmed. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ahmed Fati from ATN News. On behalf of multiple international uh, media outlets, I'll be asking the following couple of questions, if you allow me. Uh, first, uh, as you uh, said, the belliger belligerent uh, be and illicit behavior of uh, Kim Jong-un is uh, causing him uh, uh, isolation. He continuing on a path to acquire uh, nuclear uh, weapons if he have not acquired it yet. What, what is the, the, the measures that can curb uh, this uh, ongoing process? He did not budge for a, a minute uh, on it, and he's going and doing one provocation after the other. The second part is that when he conducted the long-range uh, missile, uh, ballistic missile testing, he violated the territorial water of Japan as well as their airspace. What's the, why the U.S. Uh, military uh, present in Japan and the Japanese uh, military, whom they have the, the, the hardware to counter that, why did not shoot the missile down while, while it was in their territory? Thank you. So, um, well, the first question is, is a very difficult question. We've been wrestling with the problem of this illegal nuclear program in, in North Korea for quite some time. Um, I myself worked on this problem back in the 90s and um, was involved in it in the 2000s, the last two times we had negotiations on this program. And um, unfortunately, we have not been able to get the North Koreans to abide by any of the agreements that they have signed up to in the past, and we have not been able to, um, you know, get this program eliminated in the way that we've been seeking. You asked, you know, what can, can change the course of this program? What can stop him? How can we um, keep him from doing this? I mean, that is exactly what the strategy that we've devised together with all of our international partners is aimed at, bringing unprecedented kind of pressure on the regime. We, I mean, Kim Jong-un's uh, purpose in trying to achieve this nuclear weapon is obviously to uh, fulfill a long time uh, desire on the part of the North Korean regime to uh, reunify the Korean Peninsula under the Kim family regime and to uh, proliferate these weapons, blackmail other countries, and this is some uh, an intolerable prospect that in no country in the international community can abide, and that is why it's absolutely imperative that we um, make sure that we can succeed in getting him to the table to negotiate a way forward for both his country, his people, uh, the security of his regime, which is not being enhanced by this weapons program. It will s lead to certain um, insecurity for the country and for his regime, and uh, certainly will not lead to any uh, positive future prospects for the people of North Korea. So I think this pressure, we've have, we have unprecedented um, ratcheting up of sanctions in the last couple of months. We're working to implement the sanctions regime. Uh, we had uh, UN Security Council 2371 resolution, uh, which involved banning uh, things like seafood and other exports from North Korea. We, we barely had time to start implementing that one when we had the nuclear test. Then we had in record succession uh, UN Security Council resolution 2375, both of these resolutions unanimously passed by the UN Security Council. The second one, within a week's time of beginning negotiations, it's an unprecedented uh, kind of coming together of the international community, blocking off a number of additional export sectors for North Korea. So we are in the process now of working with everyone to really implement these 
sanctions. The Treasury executive order this week was another step to try to help on the implementation and making sure there are no loopholes in the sanctions. And this, this uh, sanctions net will start to tighten and be very, very difficult for the North Korean regime, and that is the idea. So, you know, will it work? Um, I certainly uh, believe that it will work, and I think it's our last best chance, frankly, to solve this issue peacefully. And so that is what we're pursuing. Um, on the second issue of the provocations that the North Koreans have un unleashed and why are people not responding in kind, I mean, I think this goes to another point that's well worth making in case people have forgotten the history of the North Korean regime. I mean, there is just a litany over the last decades of provocations, uh, heinous acts, hijacking of airplanes, blowing up of part of the South Korean cabinet in Myanmar, um, you know, kidnappings, um, you know, kidnapping of a, of a South Korean movie producer taken to North Korea to make movies, et cetera. There's just a long list of incredibly uh, unspeakable acts that have been committed sinking of, an, of a South Korean uh, naval vessel, attacks on an island. And these things have not been responded to in kind by the international community because our focus is on defense of our allies, defense of, um, you know, the peace and security in the region. And we have shown a lot of restraint with regard to the regime in North Korea over the years. And I think um, it's quite clear that that kind of restraint and that kind of um, patience is, is nearing the end. And we see ever more provocative kinds of behavior coming. And we, it's just uh, not going to be tolerated. Sure. Uh, within international law, I spoke specifically about uh, violating airspace, violating territorial water. U.S. have uh, a longstanding uh, defense treaty with Japan and South Korea. Why the U.S. military did not respond? Why the Japanese Navy, when we have the Aegis uh, system, also which could have uh, shot this missile down, did not respond? Is that restrained except the uh, violation? The U.S., if it's responded, or Japan, it will be in full compliance with international law. That was my point. Thank you. Yeah, so I, um, I, I, I understand what you're asking. I mean, the issues of international law, there have been numerous of these illegal ballistic missile launches, some of which have landed in the uh, EEZs of other countries, particularly Japan. And, um, you know, there are warnings that have gone out now in Japan that have been automatically uh, tripped by the overflight of two missiles of the northern Japanese islands. So there are automatic civil, um, sort of civil warnings that go out. And uh, I think, you know, these are complicated matters. It's probably better if someone in the military would speak to it. But I think that um, it's easy to tell whether something is a test or not and um, approximately where it's going to land. And so I think that's probably related to your question about what, when you make a decision about whether or not to uh, take a military action. It depends a lot on the individual situation. I do know that, of course, uh, Secretary Mattis has said that if there was a missile that was you know, launched at, and he was speaking in the context of the threats that were made by the North Korean regime at that time to the island of Guam in the Pacific, that if there was a missile that was shot at Guam and was heading in a, in a, on an attack trajectory to Guam, that we would shoot it down. So that was his quote. But again, it's probably better to talk to the people who um, are in charge of the military response. Thank you. Uh, Ken Silverman, Fuji TV, uh, Japan. Um, you mentioned that the U.S. does seek a peaceful resolution uh, with North Korea. And um, I believe a couple days ago, uh, President Trump said, when asked if he would have direct talks with Kim Jong-un, he said, why not? Um, I guess on the diplomatic side, is there anything <clears throat> excuse me, that you can discuss in this forum that's going on that might be progressing in that direction, even on a track two basis? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
Well, I said, as I said in my sort of opening statement, we've got not gotten a lot of indications from North Korea uh, that they're serious about engaging, and a lot of our um, sort of attempts to open up some diplomatic space have been met by additional missile launches with longer ranges or more dramatic nuclear tests. So um, I think, you know, I wouldn't want to <laughs> indicate that there's anything other than that kind of a uh, situation on the diplomatic front at the moment. Uh, I think we're still hoping and waiting for the North Koreans to respond to some of the um, things that have already been, been stated and been put out there and to the sort of condemnation of the international community on what they're doing. I mean, we have have stated uh, openly and on the record many, many times that we're not seeking the overthrow of the regime or the collapse of the country or, you know, accelerated reunification, et cetera. So I've made it very plain what our purpose is. It's for denuclearization. That is the focus. And um, so far we've not gotten any real uh, serious signs of response. Of course, we had some contact with the North Korean side when we were engaged in the uh, attempts to negotiate the release of Otto Warmbier, which everyone uh, remembers how that um, turned out very tragically, of course, for Otto and his family. But um, so it's not that we don't have a, a channel open through which we could receive messages or indications that the North Korean was were ready to sit down and talk. That's not the issue. It's really just uh, the matter of them not signaling in any way um, that they're uh, inclined to do so. This will be the last question. <clears throat> Thank you. Manik Mehta, I'm syndicated. Uh, on the question of China, is it uh, uh, exercising enough influence on North Korea? That's number one. And since this is not working, as we have seen, would you not consider bringing in a third party just to help you uh, in your negotiations. And I'm thinking of the ASEAN region. You recall a few months back, there was an incident at Kuala Lumpur Airport, and uh, Kim had his stepbrother assassinated, and that uh, resulted in a major crisis. And it was very quickly and quietly resolved. Would something on those lines not be conceivable? Okay, thank you. Um, so first on the question of, of China, I think you've heard the President speak uh, to this in the past and also this week, um, and I mentioned also the uh, quick action in the UN Security Council, unanimous action surrounding the recent resolutions. The Treasury Secretary yesterday talked about our close cooperation with China in uh, trying to shut down illicit proliferation networks and illicit trade. Um, I think we have seen that China is doing uh, more and more as time has gone on and as the North Korean behavior has gotten more um, provocative, more outrageous. Uh, but we still think that the pressure that China can bring to bear is going to be decisive in our international effort to increase pressure, and we are in a constant discussion with them about uh, what more can be done how to do it, and what kind of cooperation we can promote to make sure that that pressure is being felt through the China angle on North Korea. And we think that it's very important for China as a P5 member, a major power in the, in the region, to uh, step up and take as much responsibility as possible for solving and helping the international community to solve this problem. So we will continue to work with them. We've been working with them uh, on this closely, and we we will continue to do so and keep keep pushing them to do more. On the issue of um, whether or not it's working, I mean, I guess you say it's not working. I say it has to work, and it is working, so we'll see. The question of mediation, whether from ASEAN or somewhere else, um, it, it sort of goes back to the question about, you know, diplomatic uh, channels, whether we have them, et cetera. I mean, and, we, and we've talked to many of the countries in ASEAN this week and, and in Europe, et cetera. Um, it's not really for a lack of channels. 
that this diplomatic, uh, you know, engagement isn't moving forward. Uh, and, you know, even in ASEAN, um, they have all worked very hard to come together to increase the pressure on North Korea to make clear that even among some of North Korea's more traditional closer partners, they have, um, you know, closed down diplomatic exchanges, um, cut down on trade uh, interactions, cut down on diplomatic missions because, I mean, they too see that the behavior has really become um, intolerable. So I think, um, you know, it's not really that we need a mediator. It's more that we need North Korea to come to the table to, to, to change, to make a decision to change the path and come to the table. And I hope we're getting uh, close to that, but so far we haven't seen any tangible evidence. Thank you very much. We're officially out of time. Thank you for coming. Today's uh, briefing was on the record, and the transcript will be posted on our website as soon as it's available. Thank you.